and uh, to allow for questions. And that can also be a time when if you have something that you want to add without getting into too many war stories, uh, but uh, just to uh, help make sure people understand what we're doing. So marking the course. And now the biggest challenge is going to be how do I change pages? There we go. Uh, so preparation, marking and management of the competition by the referees things that need to be thought about. This is not an instruction manual. It's not a procedures manual. Uh, Edward has, uh, wants uh, the focus to be on what needs to be considered when looking at a course. Equity for the players, we want it to be fair for all players. Pace of play, we know that that is a consideration that we have to uh, include. And we also want to try and avoid the possibility of penalties, especially uh, playing from a wrong place. So those are considerations that you want to keep. Edward, in putting together the this program, uh, used a variety of references, as you'll see here, the USGA, the Golf Canada's Guide to the Rules, uh, the Federation, Federation, French Federation of Golf, uh, Golf Ontario's, their referee's manual, uh, and his own experience uh, as a referee. Uh, he's taken training in marking a golf course and uh, with close to 4,000 hours of work uh, on golf courses, he, uh, he certainly brings a lot to uh, the table. He points out that uh, even with 15 years of experience, there, we do make mistakes and uh, it's important to recognize and that's how we learn. Uh, very interesting and good recommendation. When you first head out and get your cart, make a note of the cart number, because as we all know, you're going to forget something through the course of the of, of an event. And so some of the things that he admits to having left in the cart or lost over uh, the years, uh, it's, it's a valuable uh, piece of advice. Uh, We've looked at a couple of the general areas. Uh, first of all, when looking at a course for out of bounds and course boundaries, sometimes we have an internal out of bounds. And for safety reasons or for course design, here we have the T, it's a dog's leg to the, to the left. Players are expected to play along that fairway and you may have some that want to try and go for it uh, straight off. And so a committee may choose to specify that a particular part of the course is out of bounds during the play of that hole. This is done to stop players who are playing that hole from playing to and from another part of the course. Here we have a situation with uh, a road that runs through the middle of a golf course. Uh, the first question is, do you put the road as an out of bounds? Uh, and then the second one is when it's a public road running through the course. So if yes, is the ball out of bounds if it crosses the road? And what you need to do here is to consider uh, adopting a local rule that states that a ball played from one side of the road that comes to rest on the other side of that road is out of bounds. And you can see in the examples here, I believe one of these might be from Hawkesbury. Uh, I'm not sure for the other one. The other point to remember is when you are marking out of bounds and there is an end to the out of bounds, uh, that the simplest way to mark that is to put two stakes. And that will mean that everyone is aware that that's where the out of bounds finishes. Uh, special relief when there's a penalty area next to a bunker. Uh, we certainly don't come into this kind of situation as often as we might see down on uh, in Florida or on the West Coast, but uh, it can arise uh, where a player comes in, uh, crosses the bunker and enters the, the uh, area, the penalty area. Recommendation here is that you can provide drop zones that apply depending on where the point of entry is. And so that is consideration if you have a situation like this. Putting greens, a couple of key considerations. You sometimes need to clarify the edge of a putting green. In this case, we have a green that it's hard to tell where the edge of the green is. And so one of the things you can do is to put dots to indicate. And this is important because, of course, if a ball is on the green, the player has the right to mark, lift, clean and replace. If it's off the green, they do not. 
status of a practice putting green or temporary green you'll have to look at these kind of situations is it a wrong green is it out of bounds is it part of the general area is it an abnormal course condition and a double green uh, we again don't see this as often in uh, Canadian on Canadian golf courses but they, it may arise and in this case is it going to be one or two greens and if you determine that you want it to be two separate greens uh, then you will need uh, to indicate that and the suggestion here is that you would put a small dot or mark at the front of the green and a second one at the back of the green rather than drawing a line that crosses the entire green and that would be the way to indicate uh, which green a player is on and whether the other green is a double is a wrong green. Uh, special or required relief procedures. Uh, you need to look at the possibility of adding in drop zones. You may need a drop zone for a dangerous animal condition. You may need a drop zone for an abnormal course condition, such as an immovable obstruction. This has become a bit more of an issue uh, because of COVID, where you may have a movable obstruction. And because of COVID, we have switched their, uh, them to be immovable. And in that case, you may consider, uh, may want to consider line of play in your relief uh, possibilities. Normally we would not, uh, but uh, this is something that might be a concern. Uh, you may also consider using a drop zone if, a, if for a wrong green and of course for penalty areas. Uh, the final one that is often not thought of as much is for an unplayable ball and uh, I'll show you that uh, in a little more detail uh, in a minute. But the other point to make here is you can choose to make a drop zone obligatory. Uh, that is something that uh, might need to be considered. Looking at the unplayable ball, here's an example where there is a hedge behind the green. And so the ball goes into the hedge, it's unplayable. Uh, under normal circumstances, the player would have to drop behind the hedge to be no closer to the hole. And so rather than doing that, uh, the suggestion is that you might consider having uh, drop zones. And here's the example in the schematic. Uh, you could have one drop zone, you could have two. Uh, the advantage of having two is you can put a mark that indicates the center of uh, equidistance between the two drop zones. And then the player would use the drop zone closest to where his or her ball lies, has come to rest. Again, it avoids the possibility of a player playing from a wrong place and certainly it helps pace of play. Probably you won't need to be called in because it'll be pretty obvious to the player. Um, relief procedures that are not covered in the standard local rules. Uh, here's an example where we have a protective fence and the green is on the other side of the protective fence uh, and you may want to consider providing relief uh, for line of play in this case and I'll, I'll show you how to do that a little further on in the presentation. Uh, defining no play zones, defining an area out of bounds as a no play zone. As is mentioned, these are not in the standard local rules, what we refer to as the hard card. These would be part of the, uh, what you might want to include in the local rules to apply to that particular competition. And they would be in the notice to competitors. Uh, these uh, are not used as often, especially the concept of an area out of bounds as a no play zone. But here's a good example of when you might need to think about this. Here's a flower bed. Uh, golf clubs often, of course, will define flower beds as no play zones. This is a flower bed that is out of bounds. But you can see by the position of the stakes that a ball could come to rest here, we'll see it in a second here. Just it's inbounds, but a player trying to take their stance is going to be standing in uh, the no play zone in the flower bed or their swing may be compromised by the flower bed. And so there uh, is the possibility that you would can consider giving relief for an, uh, calling this a no play zone and the player would therefore get uh, the mandatory uh, relief uh, in order to uh, protect the flower bed. 
And finally, under this section, on the hard card actually in Quebec, uh, a ball deflected by a power line uh, is replayed, but, uh, whoops, uh, but the point is that was made was what if that power line is out of bounds, but somehow, but the ball happens to hit uh, that wire uh, or line, uh, a player who thinks they know, he knows the rules would say, well, my ball hit the power line, I get to replay it, cancel my stroke. And so you may need to be aware of the fact that this could be an issue and if necessary, uh, make a decision prior to competition as to how that will be handled. I think probably we would agree that it should be considered out of bounds. Um, any questions, Claire, Mary, anything that's coming up so far? No. I hope, I hope I'm not talking too fast. No, that's good. Uh, they, they are good students. All right, thank you very much. So marking the course, Edward has a couple of fun little posters like this. Uh, but one of, the ring, one of the things you were asked to do before uh, coming on tonight was to think of your own course and what might have to be considered when it comes to marking. And it's a, it's a good practical way of saying, all right, how long would it take me to survey my course and then mark it? And so as you think of think down your 18 holes, or in some cases, some of you have more than that, uh, 36, you need to consider what are the different things that are, are going to uh, need to be marked. Uh, you're going to take your tour and uh, you've, you've made notes and now you've got to get to work. Uh, so a pre-visit, uh, what are the things you're going to have to look at? You need to check the likely landing areas for tee shots. There's no point in marking a penalty area that's 20 yards in front of the green uh, when you're playing a par five. Uh, but you have to consider the type of competition, how far are the players, the average players going to hit the ball. And any of us that have done junior competitions know they're going to hit it everywhere and anywhere. Uh, so don't ever say to yourself, oh, that won't come into play because you can be sure it will at some point. Uh, another question is uh, looking at these areas as you visit the course, the transition penalty areas, out of bounds, immovable obstructions, trees as distant indicators. If a course has those trees, usually just off the fairway, uh, you need to define what they're going to be. Are they immovable obstructions? Are they a no play zone uh, where players must take relief? Uh, or is it just tough luck? You've got to play the ball as it lies. It may be a factor, maybe how far off the fairway they are, uh, but you need to make a decision on that. And of course, ground under repair. Preferred lies. Are you going to have preferred lies in closely mown areas only? Are they going to be in the general area? Uh, with COVID, we also have the issue you may have preferred lies in the bunkers only. Uh, so make those decisions and make it clear to the players. And the conditions of play must be for the same for everyone. So you can't decide partway through around, oh, you've had a, a heavy downpour and now you're going to change and say uh, people are going to get uh, free relief from certain areas. Uh, you must make sure that there's equity for the players. Uh, obviously, uh, preferred lies, we usually give one club length, but that doesn't necessarily have to always be the case. A decision will have to be made and be clear to the players. If you're certain that preferred lies are going to be in force, then you're going to mark the course differently. Certainly, you are not going to have to mark uh, abnormal ground conditions. Uh, so that's a, a factor to uh, consider. In terms of marking, your objectives of marking, the first thing is you want to ensure equity for all players. You also want to simplify the work of the referees. It's a lot easier as a referee if you can stay in a spot and not have to be moving constantly around the golf course where you might distract others and also so that uh, you are consistent in your rulings. You want clearly defined out of bounds. You want clearly defined ground under repair. And 
remember that there are left-handed and right-handed players. And this will come into play when we're talking about relief from penalty areas or marking certain areas as abnormal ground conditions. Uh, and as I said, you want to avoid having too many calls or having to move around too much uh, and be a distraction. Out of bounds. So here are some considerations. In this picture, we have one stake. This is going to be a problem because we can't see another stake. So if that is the case, you're going to have to either add more stakes or you're going to have other alternatives. Uh, I, was in, I was struck by Edward's point the other night that if a course is badly marked, he believes that we, a referee, should give the benefit of the doubt to the player because it's not the player's fault if a course has been poorly marked. Uh, in, the, in the photograph to the right, this is a time when stakes would not be practical and a line is a much better alternative. And in the final photo here, there's no need to add lines when you have stakes this clearly visible. It is also extremely difficult to draw a straight line, whether you're walking it or riding in a cart or whatever. So uh, suggestion is don't bother with lines as well. In these exa examples on the top, the curb is defining the out of bounds. If a ball is not touching grass or ground, it's gonna be out of bounds. You don't need to put in stakes. The bottom left, another example where it's obvious there's way too many stakes, uh, probably four would have sufficed. Uh, now, if a course has already put those in, you're not going to worry about uh, taking out a whole bunch, but just in general, uh, it's not necessary. In the bottom right, uh, here's an example where it's not, uh, you don't want to take the course away from the players. In this case, you can see where the ball lies. You can see where the stakes are. In the, here, the, the ball is perfectly playable. This would be a, another way of uh, ensuring that you give the maximum course to the players. Don't have the stakes out uh, that far. Put them along the edge where the ball is more likely to be uh, unplayable or it's more obviously uh, gonna be out of bounds. Uh, and again, we're going to see another example of taking the course away from the players. Here we have two stakes. Uh, we're, we're the, you're, you're looking towards the, uh, you're looking down the fairway towards the green from the from the tee. So we have the two stakes. The ball is going to be out of bounds. It's very clear. So that's option one. Option two, you could put in a third stake. And now you've given a bit more of the course to the player. You, but then you can ask yourself the question, is it necessary to have out of bounds? So yes, for pace of play, we, we like to make it pretty cut and dried. We don't have to have a ball search. Uh, you can't, uh, once you uh, can't see the ball in that area, then the ball is definitely out of bounds. However, and another point to make is, it's very difficult to draw lines when there's all those leaves there. So you are going to be using stakes, uh, not lines in this situation. But ask the question, is it necessary to have the out of bounds? No out of bounds. Okay, the player has to find their ball or they're playing under stroke and distance. Hopefully they've hit a provisional knowing that they've hit it into the, an area where it might not be found. The next example, is also a question of, do we need out of bounds? We have the out of bounds stakes on the left. We have a red penalty area that crosses just in front. The player is going to have to find their ball in the penalty area for them to get penalty relief. Otherwise, it, they're gonna to have to play under stroke and distance. Can we avoid this situation? Yes, we can. Again, Considering pace of play, even here we would have the search, so it's going to take time. So another option would be mark the area as a red penalty area. Remove the OB stakes, and that way the player doesn't find the ball in this close-up area, 
outside of the penalty area, now they can proceed under uh, Rule 17. A common problem I can think of, I think the course that comes to mind for me is Beaconsfield, but I know this occurs at other courses where you have a hedge, a little bit of the course and a, and a cart path. The green is off to the right. First example or first option, it's out of bounds. It's very easy to tell if the ball is out of bounds. Uh, you're not gonna have to have a long search, so pace of play isn't an issue uh, and they will have, have to proceed under stroke and distance. But once again, you're taking away, you're taking the course away from the players, but you are eliminating an unplayable ball because anything uh, within the hedge is out of bounds. Option two, remove the stakes and leave the entire hedge in play. It does mean the player is gonna have to find their ball. And it does mean that there's a certainly a possibility of an unplayable ball, but we've given the course more of the course to the players. And you're gonna to have to have a ball search. So that is gonna affect pace of play in this case. Another possibility, well, just go back. Another possibility is to put in red stakes and declare it uh, so it becomes a penalty area and perhaps even add a drop zone to the side of the cart path. So that way, if the ball is in the hedge, player can choose to play it or they can take penalty relief, making use of the drop zone. Uh, any questions, any comments? Yeah, there was a question on um, just to go back to the power line issue. Yep. And what happens if the, let me just read the exact question. Um, if a ball hits a power line that is out of bounds, but comes to rest in bounds, so that would be something that would have to be uh, uh, agreed upon. I would, my own reaction would be, well, that's a good one. I think that would have to be something that it is decided. Uh, and uh, whether you apply the, the standard local rule and, and not worry about it, or if you say a ball that hits uh, a, a wire power line that is out of bounds and lands out of bounds versus inbounds. So that would be something that would have to be decided uh, beforehand and so that you wouldn't have the dithering that I'm doing now. I think it's important if I can just add, because when the question came up, I was looking at the model local rule. And in the introduction to that, they do discuss the fact that it's not intended that you replay the ball um, if it hits something out of bounds, but then the actual model local rule doesn't address that. But I think the point that they make in the intro is that you would only bring this, this local rule into force for, for a competition for a situation where the power line is in play on the golf course somehow. So you'd have to figure out when you do your model, your local rule, you'd have to figure out a way to define that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Nancy. Yes, Claire. I just wrote, uh, just read the last sentence of the, the first paragraph of E11. I wrote it. The, this local rule should not gener generally be used for power lines that do not interfere with play of a hole or are out of bounds. So if it hits a power line that's out of bounds and kicks on on the course, well, good for you. And I don't think we yeah. should play it. Yeah, you're lucky. Yeah. 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 But it would have to be clear. And this is a good example for all of us when it, we do uh, the local rules uh, that we have to be aware that these kind of situations can arise and uh, try and discuss them beforehand so uh, we know how we're going to rule. Yeah. All right. Anything else there? Okay. On we go to abnormal course conditions. We're back to our protective fence. Uh, where it might come into, uh, might be line of play. Uh, the ball is going to be around here. Um, and as the point is made also because of COVID, we are declaring some movable obstructions to be immovable. And these can be things like stakes, signs and ropes. And uh, if they are uh, on the line of play, we may decide to give the player relief. 
In this example, uh, this is uh, what we often will call a TIO or a temporary immovable obstruction, uh, where we are going to give line of play relief. Uh, in order to determine that, uh, there is quite a procedure. Uh, some of you will know this, some of you will not have seen this example before. But the first option for, the, for in Golf Quebec, we allow the player to choose which side of the obstruction they are going to uh, go to, and you move until you can see the flag and place a T. Step so either to the left or to the right. In step two, you then measure one club length and place a second T. And from the second T you then measure one club length and drop the ball in this relief area. So from the first, from the T, you are actually going to be getting two club lengths total uh, in terms of where you determine your relief area. There is a good diagram in the uh, uh, official guide uh, to the rules of golf and you can look and see how that can be handled in other circumstances. Uh, very important, we mentioned it earlier, but the, the left versus right handed. And when you're looking at possible relief areas, you need to be aware of that fact. And so we see some examples here where a left handed player versus a right handed player where they would be taking their relief from this cart path, depending on where their ball uh, it has come to rest. And so just keep that in mind. Another issue here, of course, is uh, when you do get uh, relief from an immovable obstruction, it is the nearest point of complete relief, not the best. And so in this situation, you've got to remember what the relief procedure is going to be and be aware that players, of course, are going to always try and talk you into letting them get the best relief. But in this case, it's very obvious that C is closer, closer to where the ball lies than B is. And so the player would have to take relief uh, at C or play the ball as it lies. Ground under repair. This is often an interesting situation uh, where you have the cart path, you have a penalty area, but you can also see that there is a significant area of ground on repair to the right of the cart path. It's going to be difficult for the player to drop a ball uh, without have and not avoid the ground on repair. So what you can do is you can mark the area contingent to the cart path. You don't circle it as separate from the cart path. You make it an extension of the cart path. So then when the player is taking their relief, they're going to be able to take relief on the other side of the uh, ground under repair. So you link it to the cart path. What you want to avoid is this situation. You don't want to circle it because then you make a, a real mess of things. And you can see too, with the line being slightly in, you've really affected how a player is going to take a drop. This is would definitely affect play of play and also uh, right-handed versus left-handed players as well. Uh, another possibility, and this has been used, is you could apply for this particular hole, a local rule allowing for preferred lies. And so you would specify that as preferred lie in the general area on the particular hole. And uh, the example given uh, was this was done in the Canada Cup in 2018, and that way it alleviated the problem altogether. Uh, more on abnormal course conditions, summer rules versus preferred lies. Uh, obviously marking is going to be different. We'll look at some actually definitely less marking. Here's an example, you come to the course first thing in the morning uh, and uh, you've had a, a downpour, a washout, part of a bunker, uh, you've got different possibilities. When only one part of the bunker is ground under repair, you can paint a line and define that area as ground under repair. There's no problem with painting uh, part of a bunker. In the other situations, uh, oh, and also you need to check to see, are there any drains or liners that might affect play? Uh, that is in the, in the standard local rules uh, that liners, uh, players may get relief if it affects their play in certain situations. Uh, 
in some cases, you may need to consider a bunker as ground under repair. I, the two examples that you see here are both possibilities. And so you would have put that uh, on the, in your local rules. Here's another case where that storm also blew down a tree. Uh, and in normal cases, uh, we often will say tough luck. Uh, that tree may be, uh, uh, it's not right now going to be removed. And so you would not, under normal circumstances, be, giving, be given relief for line, for line of play. However, in certain circumstances, you may choose to add a local rule permitting the additional re relief option for, uh, unplay for a ball that is uh, affected by a line of play. Um, here we go. Uh, and there's the your two possibilities for a damaged tree consideration of line and play. In the bottom photograph, in this case, it is hard to, def to define where does the rough and the fairway meet. Uh, you may need to add a dotted line uh, to avoid unnecessary delays or the possibility of a ball being played from a wrong place. Uh, this could happen if you've said that uh, preferred lies in closely mown areas, players not sure if they're in the closely mown area or, uh, or not. And so uh, you wanna make sure that they do not make a mistake. In this photograph, you have a large area of damage in front of the green. Uh, it is not recommended when you have a huge area like this to draw a line, to draw a big circle around it. Uh, white paint burns the grass. The grass will take a good three weeks or more to recover from that. So you can do dotted lines, lines that define or even simply put a, a mark in each of the four corners of the square or rectangle. And in that way, players will know uh, that it's uh, ground under repair. And if necessary, you could even implement a local rule allowing for preferred lies from this area, in this area only uh, as, as a further option. Stumps, uh, is it ground under repair or not? The first example is pretty obvious. Uh, the stump has recently been removed. It's been marked. There's uh, in fact a, a white line to, to circle it not ground on repair. Here's a case where at some point, a number of trees have been taken down. However, it's a, it's a whole area. You're not going to give relief from a particular stump uh, and it's not considered as ground under repair. However, you may come up with a situation like this where the stump has been dug up. The hole has been filled in, there's mulch there. Uh, you. The consideration here is probably going to be one of how close is this to the fairway, uh, to the general area of play. The, uh, the, if it's right close to the edge of the fairway, you may want to give a player, uh, consider this as ground under repair and a player gets relief. However, if it's uh, off the fairway by a good bit, uh, then uh, the player's not really supposed to be that far off course and you might just say you've got to play it as it lies. Uh, uh, another ex expression of Edwards that I think is very good here is, there's no such thing as a bad lie in the rough. You have to accept what you have uh, and uh, on you go. Uh, this would be one of those things that is decided by the rules chair and uh, before the competition is done. How far is it from the tee? What's the level of a player's ability? Uh, is, it, is the uh, area permanent or temporary? Freshly done. No play zones. Uh, lovely picture from the Masters. At the Masters, they make the players play from these flower beds. Uh, but for us, probably we might consider that a no play zone or a drop zone is more practical. And we define this as a no play zone. A service road is generally not considered as being artificially surfaced, therefore not an immovable obstruction. So why would you give relief? Ball is generally in the woods, often difficult to find an area of complete relief close by. So considering that and pace of play, you're probably better to uh, have the player proceed under stroke and distance. Hopefully they've played a provisional ball. Uh, 
this is a, a, a service road and uh, really shouldn't be uh, considered in play. Edward has pointed out that there are a number of tools to the trade that you want to have for marking. Uh, but before we do that, I'll check to see if there's any questions. No, all is good. It was all answered. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, notice uh, uh, one of the things included in there is bug spray. A very, very good uh, reminder to uh, if you're going about marking in, in the woods, you might want to have a bit of protection as well as paint. So we'll look at penalty areas now. Uh, the basic principles are we are edges are marked by a yellow or red line. However, of course, if there's a lack of time or budget restrictions, then you might uh, use uh, physical features. And in Golf Quebec, uh, we uh, certainly have made use of the fact that Rule 17 says that the edges of a penalty area are defined by red or yellow lines or when there are no lines by unmown grass, otherwise known as long grass. In this example, uh, the stakes have been put parallel all the way along. And so then there becomes the question of where, are, where is the ball in relation to uh, the edge of the penalty area? Uh, the suggestion here is that the stakes should be used simply to warn the players that there is a penalty area ahead and let the long grass on either side of uh, this lateral uh, penalty area or red penalty area, as we now call it, uh, define the edges. Natural indicator slope can be another example. Now, in this penalty area, we want to take note of the issue of right versus left-handed. So the lie of the ball is right there. The, 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 sorry, the ball is right there. A right-handed player would not have a relief area because of the cart path, because of where uh, the cart path is in relation to the line. A left-handed player, of course, would be able to claim, ask for relief because of the cart path, be able to drop it on the other side. And a right-handed player, if they're smart, are gonna suggest, well, I would use a left-handed stroke here and uh, therefore I want relief. So we wanna avoid those kind of situations. It would be much more practical to have the red line up uh, at the edge of the cart path. And this gives equity to the players. They will both be given a similar relief area. It is important to remember known or virtually certain. So when you are marking a course, you need to ask yourself, could the ball be lost anywhere other than in the penalty area? And we have a couple of examples here. This is a nice stream, 250 yards off the tee, and now we look at it from a different point of view. Here's our course. We've got trees there, so there's our nice uh, stream. It's marked red. The player has to ask, could the ball be lost outside the penalty area? Known or virtually certain? In this case, there's no way to know for sure unless you find the ball in the penalty area. And so the player is gonna have to proceed under stroke and distance. You have an alternative. And that is red stakes. Penalty area, it's a red penalty area. So the player does not have to find the ball. All they do is determine the approximate uh, point where the ball crossed the edge of the penalty area and take their relief from there. Back to our stream. You could add red stakes, but what are the chances, first of all, that the ball will be found or if found that the ball will be playable or that it, there is a relief area available. Player would have to proceed under stroke and distance. Uh, and that's gonna be an issue in terms of pace of play and the ball search. So if uh, you could have another option and that is consider the forest as a penalty area so that you would have your uh, red stakes out on the, uh, on the outside edge of the forest. And that way, once the ball has entered the area, there's no obligation for the player to find the ball. When long grass lines a penalty area, in this case, the stakes are indicating the penalty area, the grass, long grass defines the edge of the penalty area. There's no need to add in lines. 
common question is when do you mark something as red or as yellow? And so you need to look at an option like this. Here we have a green partially surrounded by a, a penalty area. The ball is hit from the tee, crosses at one point with it's a red stake, a red penalty area, crosses over a bit of land and then ends up in the penalty area. So it's not where the ball last crossed the penalty area there. It is going to be where it crossed up by the green. It's going to be often very difficult for the player to know exactly whether the ball crossed uh, over at that point or not. And so if it's a red relief area, you have question of where did the ball cross or did it cross at all. If it is marked yellow, it's much simpler because you know where the ball last crossed. There's your point of reference. And that's going to be where your relief area will be. You may want to have a drop zone in this case, and that then makes it quite simple in terms of uh, where the player will drop the ball because they may have issues with dropping the ball if you've got a number of trees and other things in that area just to the right of the penalty area. So when it is yellow, there would be less confusion. Where to put the line? Here's one of those situations where you almost go away from the idea of give a lot of the course to the players because in here we want to also consider safety for the players. If you put the line down very low uh, to the uh, to the edge of the penalty area, you are making it very difficult for the player to take a stance and to uh, make their shot. And when you figure they're already penalized uh, for and going to be taking one stroke, uh, you might as well give them an area where they are going to be able to drop the ball and, and make a shot. So you are thinking of the safety of the players uh, and you also um, will give them an area to drop the ball. No play zones. The stakes generally are not put in the same place. Here, an example, the no play zone is usually marked with a red stake and a green top. Uh, there may be other ways. Sometimes you see blue being used. Uh, it'll depend on the course, uh, perhaps, or what is available. But it's important to put the line in the best place. So here you can see a normal penalty area. And then you can see where you might want to put the line uh, higher in order to uh, provide a place for the player to drop the ball. Continuing on the idea of placement of a red or a yellow line, with the new rules uh, from 2019, the position of the line isn't as important because the players can remove loose impediments. A line lower on the bank gives the player the possibility of an embedded ball from which the ball player will be able to take relief. So in this case, having the line a bit lower as opposed to higher means you've given the player a bit more of the course and they will uh, be able to use that. Or of course, you may also have given uh, the rule might be for preferred lies in the general area and the player would also then uh, be able to uh, take advantage of the vocal rule. Here's a couple of other instances where a penalty area may be marked a little differently. Uh, an asphalt path has been used up on the left uh, and a curb has been uh, painted red on the right. Uh, it becomes very obvious what is in and what is, uh, what is in the penalty area, what is not. However, as when you're marking a course, avoid this practice of painting a line across an asphalt path because the paint does not wear away for a very long time. When a stream is adjacent to woods, yes, you could mark like this, but then you're going to have the issue of going to have to find the ball in the penalty area. It's got to be known or virtually certain because it could have crossed over the penalty area and be in the woods on the other side. It also could have crossed over and bounced back in, which means that the point of entry theoretically is on uh, the other side as well. So in Golf Quebec, what we normally do is we mark a course this way, we put in red stakes and we apply a local rule, it's an on a hard card, 
that when a penalty area is defined on only one side, it's deemed to extend to infinity. When a red penalty area joins a boundary, the penalty area extends to and coincides with the boundary. So that way you eliminate the confusion Here's a situation where, again, the player would have to find their ball in order to use rule 17. So what we would do is we would remove the out of bounds and therefore the ball has crossed into the field of corn or it's in the, or it's in the water, it doesn't matter where. And this is an actual example from uh, the Champions Tour when it was played at La Tompette. La Tompette. So here's how the ball would enter penalty areas deemed to extend to infinity. Uh, these two examples uh, show different differences in perhaps marking. In the first situation, you've got a large culvert, a large area crossing over a penalty area. And so there's a good possibility the ball could end up on the, on the path, on the gravel. And wanting to give the player the course, uh, they would then be able to ask for uh, relief from that part of it because it is not included in the penalty area. However, on the right, where the situation is the ball could end up under the bridge, uh, not as likely on the bridge, you mark it yellow. And in that case, then you don't have to worry about a player asking for relief because there's an obstruction, their ball is under the bridge because the bridge is part of the penalty area. Uh, any questions? No, okay. all is good. Okay, Nothing. moving along. Pin placements. Uh, usually when we get to a tournament, a Golf Quebec tournament, one of our jobs is, uh, each morning is to check the pin placements. Uh, you see a pin sheet like this and the specific hole on the right to show you how it is done. For those of you that may not have seen this before, so the way it works is 27 represents the depth of the green from front to back. 10 represents, and here we see the 27 from front to back. 10 represents the distance of the flag from the front of the green as marked from where you paste it off. And then six is the six paces from the right side. The minus four up at the top is just uh, indicates how how much forward from center of the green. Uh, it also can be calculated pretty much by the fact that if you know it's 27 paces on, then it's 10, 10 paces from the front. Now, when we're marking, we often need to consider where the players are come approaching the green from. And this could be an example where you have a par five for women, a par four for men. And you would start at the front of the green. In the women's case, you can see how uh, the depth of the green is going to be less than for the men because of the direction in which they're coming from. There's one example, and there's the second example, 20 versus 32. You look back down at the fairway to see where the players are coming from and consider the also consider the club most likely to be used. And that's where you see the two examples, A and B. It's useful here too, to mark the front of the green to make it easier for the hole cutter because they may not realize that you are determining that it's gonna be the closer spot of uh, on F or it's gonna be on H. You also in some, some cases may want to consider indicating the distance from both sides. This would be a good example where uh, it's hard to tell that there's very little green on the right, uh, even, uh, or even though uh, it's a little more than what's on the left. We don't do this very often, but there is the odd occasion and you're trying to make it as simple as you can for the player. When the pin placement is equidistant from the left and the right sides, as in this case, we use this also if we have more than 10 steps on the short side. So that means that we know the pin is more or less in the middle of the green, even if it's slightly one side or the other. Uh, it's especially obvious on wider greens where it's not as big of a factor. Any comments or questions on marking greens? Nope, nothing okay. on the chat. 
And uh, and just so people know, uh, there we hopefully we're going to be having a follow up presentation that talks more specifically about things like pin placements and uh, course setup. Uh, so uh, we'll be keeping you posted on that. So finally, uh, I think almost finally, perhaps uh, another responsibility for referees uh, the, the morning of a tournament is to place the T markers. Uh, a neat little tool, if you don't have one, is this little T. Uh, device here that uh, you can make with some PVC and fold it up. Um, I'm planning to ask my husband to make me one. Uh, it helps you make sure that you align and uh, center the tees for going down the fairway. Also, when you mark, uh, you usually want to indicate each day you're going to do a, a method where you, uh, so that if for some reason if a tee marker gets moved, uh, it can be replaced in its proper place. So tee markers, Sometimes you will use the club tees, and there's simple examples of those. Sometimes you will use uh, club tees you will see here. Uh, they come in all different colors and varieties. Golf Quebec has very good tee markers. Uh, they're uh, quite straightforward and uh, easy for the players to identify. Uh, there is a danger when you are using tee markers, especially these ones down below. Blue and black can look awful similar. So we strongly recommend that you try and avoid having those both uh, on, used in the same competition or certainly on the same tee. When you are having uh, tee markers or category uh, players in the same in different categories using the tee markers, you can set them up like this, where you put the two together, or you can set them up where you use one of each. Either one is acceptable. Uh, it, uh, uh, it, you just want to make sure that you avoid any uh, situation where uh, the players might make a mistake. You don't put them one behind the other because then in that case, uh, players could end up playing from the wrong place if they played from uh, the white, the, if the white were behind the red and they played with the red. Uh, anyway, it just adds confusion. So please try and avoid that. Another danger that you want to avoid is if you're using the same T markers on the first T, we strongly suggest you separate them to some extent because you don't want when the players come to the second hole to go to the red T when they should are supposed to be playing the yellow T's. As is noted here, hole number one serves as the last firewall for those who do not read the notice to competitors. It's also necessary to provide for left and right-handed players. Uh, if you have bushes on the side of the tee, you need to make sure that uh, both, both right and left are going to have uh, full use of the teen area. So be careful there. Uh, here, you need to be careful with the color of the tee. It's a good example. And then you need to also consider anything that's behind the tee. If you put the tee markers too far back, uh, and there is long, uh, there's long grass. You need to give them at least three paces from the long grass so that there is no interference for their swing. They also want sometimes be able to take a step back from uh, where except for two back from the teen area. And if there is a hedge or bushes, uh, rule of thumb is at least four paces uh, to provide sufficient space for them. And. There we go, we see that. And then finally, just what is available to referees, there are documents. Uh, I think most of you, we covered this at our uh, uh, spring meeting the, uh, last week. Uh, conditions of the competition are there. Uh, on Golf Quebec site will be draw, pairings, tee times, the standard local rules, the notice to competitors, pin placement sheet, evacuation plan. Those will all be available to players uh, on the website and to referees. Uh, working documents that we would be using on the course would include things like the pace of play, uh, timing sheets, uh, incidents reports, and uh, schedule or hours. So that concludes my report. And again, I want to acknowledge that I was just the speaker and uh, uh, to give uh, Edward uh, full credit for, uh, for, for, for the work that he did. So, questions, comments? Go no, for it. There was no question in the chat. 
Well, that's easy. <laughs> All right. Well, I thank everybody for joining us. I hope you got something out of it. And if you do have any questions and want to follow up, uh, please feel free. And also, as I say, I know you folks up at the OVGA area have uh, uh, good resources uh, amongst yourselves. And uh, I hope that we get to work together at some point during the year. Merci beaucoup. C'est fantastic. Thanks, yeah, Jean. Fan fantastic. Thank you. Nancy. It was Thank great. you very much. Good. Glad Thank you enjoyed you. it. Yeah, it was good. Thank you.